Welcome back to the giraffe and the pelly and me. This is part five where the squad cars have just arrived at the Duke's mansion. There we go. Within seconds, we were surrounded by six policemen and the Duke was shouting to them, the villain you are after is inside the beak of that bird. Stand by to collar him. And to the pelican he said, Get ready to open up. Are you ready? Steady? Go. Open up. The pelican opened his giant beak and immediately the policeman pounced upon the burglar who was crouching inside. They snatched his pistol away from him and dragged him out and put handcuffs on his wrists. Great Scott, shouted the chief of police. It's the cobra himself. The who? The what? Everyone asked, who's the cobra? The cobra is the cleverest and most dangerous cat burglar in the world, said the chief of police. He must have climbed up that drain pipe. The cobra can climb up anything. My diamonds, screamed the Duchess. I want my diamonds. Where are my diamonds? They are, they are, here they are, cried the chief. Here, here they are, cried the chief of police, fishing great handfuls of jewellery from the burglar's, burglar's pockets. The Duchess was so overcome with relief that she fell to the ground in a faint. When the police had taken away the fearsome burglar known as the Cobra and the fainting Duchess had been carried into the house by her servants, the old Duke stood on the lawn with the giraffe, the pelican and the monkey and me. Look, cried the monkey, that rotten burglar's bullet has made a hole in poor Pelly's beak. That's done it, said the pelican. No, it won't be any use for holding water when we clean the windows. Oh, sad, isn't it? Don't you worry about that, my dear Pelly, said the Duke, patting him on the beak. My chauffeur will soon patch, put a patch over it in the same, same way he mends the tyres on the rolls. Right now, we have far more important things to talk about than a little hole in your beak. We, st he, we stood there waiting to see what the Duke was going to say next. Now listen to me, all of you, he said. Those diamonds were worth millions, millions and millions, and you have saved them. The monkey nodded, the giraffe smiled, and the pelican blushed. No reward is too great for you, the, junk, the Duke went on. I am therefore going to make you an offer which I hope will give you pleasure. I hereby invite the giraffe and the pelican and the monkey to live on my estate for the rest of their lives. I shall give you my best and largest hay barn as your private house, central heating, showers, a kitchen, and anything else you desire for your comfort will be installed. In return, you will keep my windows clean and pick my cherries and my apples. If the pelican is willing, perhaps he will also give me a ride in his beak now and again. A pleasure, your grace, cried the pelican. Would you like a ride now? Later, said the duke. I'll have one after tea. At this point, the giraffe gave a nervous little cough <coughs> and looked up at the sky. Is there a problem? asked the Duke. If there is, do please let me hear it. I don't like to sound ungrateful or pushy, murmured the giraffe, but we do have one very pressing problem. We are all absolutely famished. We haven't eaten for days. 
My dear Giraffe, cried the Duke, how very thoughtless of me. Food is no problem around here. I'm afraid it's not quite as easy as all that, said the Giraffe. You see, I myself happen to be... Don't tell me, cried the Duke. I know it already. I am an expert on the animals of Africa. The moment I saw you, I knew you were no ordinary giraffe. You are the geranius variety, are you not? You are absolutely right, your grace, said the giraffe. But the trouble is with us that we only eat. You don't have to tell me that either, cried the duke. I know perfectly well a geranius giraffe can eat only one kind of food. Am I not right in thinking that the pink and purple flowers of the tinkle tree, the tinkle tinkle tree, are your only diet? Yes, said the giraffe, and that's been my problem ever since I arrived on these shores. That is no problem at all here at Hampshire House, said the duke. Look over there, uh, look, look over there, my dear giraffe, and you will see the only plantation of tinkle tinkle trees in the entire country. The giraffe looked. She gave a gasp of astonishment, and at first she was so overwhelmed she couldn't even speak. Great toys, tr great tears of joy began running down her cheeks. Help yourself, said the Duke. Eat all you want. Oh, my sainted souls, gasped the giraffe. Oh, my naked neck. I cannot believe what I'm seeing. The next moment she was galloping full speed across the lawns and whinnying with excitement. And the last we saw of her, she was burying her head in the beautiful pink and purple flowers that blossomed on the tops of the trees all around her. As for the monkey... As for the monkey, the Duke went on, I think he will also be pleased, pleased with what I have to offer. All over my estate there are thousands of giant nut trees. Nuts, cried the monkey. What kind of nuts? Walnuts, of course, said the Duke. Walnuts, screamed the monkey. Not walnuts. You, do, you don't really mean walnuts. You're pulling my leg. You're joking. You can't be serious. I must have heard wrong. There's a walnut tree right over there, the duke said, pointing. The monkey took off like an arrow and a few seconds later he was high up in the branches of the walnut tree, cracking the nuts and guzzling what was inside. That leaves only the pelly, said the Duke. Yes, said the pelican nervously, but I'm afraid what I eat does not grow on trees. I only eat fish. Would it be too much trouble, I wonder, if I were to ask you for a reasonably fresh piece of haddock or cod every day. Haddock or cod, shouted the Duke, spitting out the words as though they made a bad taste in his mouth. Cast your eyes, my dear Pelly, over there to the south. The pelican looked across the vast rolling estate, and in the distance he saw a great river. That is the River Hamp, cried the Duke, the finest salmon river in the whole of Europe. Salmon, screeched the pelican. Not salmon. You don't really mean salmon. It's full of salmon, the duke said. And I own it. You can help yourself. Before he had finished speaking, the pelican was in the air. The duke and I watched him as he flew full speed towards the river. We saw him circle over the water. Then he dived and disappeared. A few, months late, a few moments later, he was in the air again and he had a giant big salmon in his mouth.
I stood there alone with the Duke on the lawn beside his great house. Well, Billy, he said, I'm glad they are all happy. But what about you, my lad? I am wondering if you happen to have just one extra special little wish all for yourself. If you do, I'd love you to tell me about it. There was a sudden tingling in my toes. It felt as though something tremendous might be going to happen to me any moment. Yes, I murmured nervously. I do have one extra special little wish. And what might that be? said the Duke in a kindly voice. There is an old wooden house near where I live, I said. It's called the Grubber. And long ago, it used to be a sweet shop. I have wished and wished that one day somebody might come along and make it into a marvellous new sweet shop all over again. Somebody, cried the Duke. What do you mean, <coughs> somebody? You and I will do that. We'll do it together. We'll make it into the most wonderful sweet shop in the whole world. And you, my boy, will own it. Whenever the old Duke got excited, his enormous moustache started to bristle and jump about. Right now, they were jumping up and down so much, it looked as though he had a squirrel on his face. By gad, sir, he cried, waving his stick. I shall buy the place today. Then we'll all get to work and have the whole thing ready to go in no time. You just wait and see what sort of sweet shop we are going to make out of this grubber place of yours. It was amazing how quickly things began to happen after that. There was no problem about buying the house because it was owned by the giraffe and the pelly and the monkey and they insisted upon giving it to the duke for nothing. Then the builders and carpenters moved in and rebuilt the whole of the inside so that once again it had three floors. On all these floors they put together rows and rows of tall shelves and there were ladders to climb up to the highest shelves and baskets to carry what you bought. Then the sweets and chocks and toffees and fudges and nougars began pouring in to fill the shelves. They came by aeroplane from every country in the world the most wild and wondrous things you could ever imagine. There were gum twizzlers and fizz winkles from China, froth blowers and spit sizzlers from Africa, tummy ticklers and gob wangles from the Fiji Islands, and lip lickers and plush nuggets from the land of the midnight sun. For two whole weeks, the flood of boxes and sacks continued to arrive. I could no longer keep track of all the countries they came from, but you can bet your life that as I unpacked each new batch, I sampled it carefully. I can remember especially the giant wangdoodles from Australia. Every one with a huge ripe red strawberry hidden inside its crispy chocolate crust and the electric fizz cocklers that made every hair on your head stand straight up on end as soon as you popped one into your mouth. And there were nish nobblers and gum glotters and blue bubblers and sherbet slurpers and tongue rakers and as well as all this, there was a whole lot of splendid stuff from the great Wonka factory itself. For example, the famous Willy Wonka rainbow, rainbow drops. Suck them and you can spit in seven different colours. And this stick jaw for talkative parents. And this mint jujubes that will give you the boy next door green teeth for a month. 
On the grand opening day, I decided to allow my customers to help themselves for free. And the place was so crowded with children, you could hardly move. The television cameras and the newspaper reporters were all there. And the old duke himself stood outside in the road with my friends, the giraffe and the pelly and the monkey, watching the marvellous scene. I came out of the shop to join them for a few moments. I brought each of them a bag of extra special sweets as a present. To the Duke, because the weather was a little chilly, I gave him some scarlet scorch droppers that had been sent to me from Iceland. The label said that they were guaranteed to make the person who sucked them as warm as toast even if we were standing stark naked at the North Pole in midwinter. The moment the Duke opened one, popped one into his mouth, thick smoke came gushing out of the old boy's nostrils in such terrific quantities that his moustaches were going up in flames. Terrific, he cried, hopping about. Tremendous stuff. I'll take up the case of them home with me. You see all the smoke coming out of the duke's mouth? To the giraffe I gave a bag of glumptious glow gobblers. Glob gobblers. Glob gobblers. The glob gobbler is an especially delicious sweet that is made somewhere near Mecca. And at the moment you bite into it, all the perfume juices of Arabia go squirting down your gullet mm. one after the other. It's wonderful, cried the giraffe as a cascade of lovely liquid flavours poured all the way down her long throat. It's even better than my favourite pink and purple flowers. And to the pelican I gave a big bag of pishlets. Pishlets, as you probably know, are bought by children who are unable to whistle a tune as they walk along the street, but long to do so. They had a splendid effect upon the pelican, for after he had put one of them into his beak and chewed it for a while, he st suddenly started singing like a nightingale. This made him wildly excited because pelicans are not songbirds. No pelican had ever been known to whistle a tune before. To the monkey I gave a bag of devil's drenches, those small, fiery black sweets that one is not allowed to sell to children under four years old. When you have sucked a devil's drencher for a minute or so, you, a minute or so, you can set your breath alight and blow a huge column of fire 20 feet into the air. The duke put a match to the monkey's breath and shouted, Blow, monkey, blow! A sheet of orange flame shot up as high as the roof of the grubber house and it was wonderful. My word. And I've got to leave you now, I said. I must go and look after my customers in the shop. We must go too, said the giraffe. We have 100 windows to clean before dark. I said goodbye to the Duke and then one by one I said goodbye to the three best friends I had ever had. Suddenly we all became very quiet and melancholy and the monkey looked as though, as though he was about to cry as he sang me a little song of farewell. We have tears in our eyes as we wave our goodbyes. We so loved being with you, we three. So do please now and then come and see us again, the giraffe and the pelly and me. All you do is to look at a page in this book because that's where we always will be. No book ever ends when it's full of your friends, the giraffe and the pelly and me. And that's the end of the story. Hope you enjoyed that. Cohen and Lily and Albie, Evie and Iris and Hunter. We'll have another book soon. Lots of love from Gigi and... Brenda.
Grandad. Grandad. And if Grandad can just come and give you a wave. He's in his dressing gown. Where are you, Grandad? He's coming this side. Bye-bye. See you soon. Love you all. Bye.